It's good to see you back. Are you ready for the last round? Um, you're in for a treat. Dr. Tom will share with us a concept that I have had the privilege to have seen, what, 20 years ago plus? And um, at the time got really very excited about it. Uh, I was a, um, a leadership developer in Russia at the time before I was actually called to the seminary here. And that was one of the concepts that began to really make the rounds in my own mind. And Dr. Tom shared it with us in a class at Fuller. And I began to immediately see something that I'd never seen before, um, which he at the time called the universal disciple. Now, let me just check something here. Yes, I carry with me wherever I go this little card because Tom taught us at that time that if you cannot explain what it means to be a Christian and how to live the Christian life in a compact way, you don't know what you're talking about. And um, in the meantime, he made it so concrete that you can actually uh, carry it in your wallet. I'm not sure if he has these cards with him, but I do know that he has brought a few other things because some people have bombarded him. What have you written? And so what has happened is he has had in the back of his car a few of his publications. And so at the end of this lecture, we will be talking a little bit about it for those of you who are interested. There is a few jewels that we actually have here that he would be willing to share, plus it would make his luggage a little lighter. So let's get started with prayer and then the time is his. Lord, Lord of this world, you have blessed us already in these past three sessions and expanded our vision of what you're doing in the world and how we can enter into the global conversation as followers of Jesus Christ. And so we ask for a blessing as we come to this last session. And as we talked about, as we will talk about the actual content of that conversation, the J-shaped conversation. And we just pray that your spirit may be present and that we might be energized as we learn together what it was that made it possible for the church in the first century within one generation to reach practically every town, every center of population in the civilization then. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have now to again enter into a conversation with Tom, Dr. Tom. Please bless him and sustain him as he shares with us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. When we finish this hour and a half together, you should be able to present on a napkin to any person anywhere in the world what it means to follow Jesus. Any replicating movement has a core pattern whether you are Muslim, Mormon, or Methodist, whether you are Buddhist, Baptist, or Baha'i, there is a core in replicating movements that is passed on like a DNA. Around 1960, studying in the sixth floor library in downtown Chicago, I ran across a little book, The Catechism of the Early Christian Church. 
It's only about 90 pages, published by Cambridge University Press. But when I went away from, from reading that small little booklet, I realized that I had really come across something powerful. Uh, like a chicken on an egg, I sat on that concept for about 20 years. Oh, here we go. And take a break. We'll be right back. Sorry, not sorry. I realized that uh, that's, that's fine right there. What I wanted to do is to do this freehand with you, not only using the technology, the overhead, I mean the uh, PowerPoint presentation, but to actually draw it so that, um, uh, so that you can get a grasp of some of the simplicity and everything. So after about 20 years, I'm a little bit of a slow learner. I've been percolating on this for a good while, and we had some friends in Mexico City ask if we would help them in their leadership development. And I went back and looked at it again, and, and I was like that proverbial chicken. All of a sudden, it was a And it hatched. Okay. So since then, beginning in the 1990s, I began to share this. By that time, I had moved from being a part of a pastoral team in East Los Angeles. I went from the bottom 2% of economics in California to the top 2% in Marin County in San Francisco. Both of them were cross-cultural experiences. But since then, uh, I've shared this around the world, and many of what's called the church planting movements around the world have this. this. The diagram that I'm going to show you is in multiple languages, um, the European languages, whether it's French, German, Czech, Russian, etc. Uh, it's in Arabic, it's in Swahili, uh, it's, it's in lots of different languages, Hindi, Marathi, etc. In a previous era of history, we were in the time of the ordained. If God spoke into your heart about just total commitment, the normal counsel was whatever work you're doing, whatever profession you're in, abandon that, become ordained, and do full-time Christian work. I believe that we have shifted we have shifted from the era of the, or, of the ordained to the era of the ordinary. So that when God speaks into your heart, the first response is not to abandon your past, but to embrace your past. If we have an opportunity to advance ourselves, then fine. Paul said, if you are a slave, First of all, give praise to God in even that bondage. But if you have an opportunity, well, then take the opportunity. So maybe there's reason to say, but we are to abide in our calling. The early Christian church did not move forward as a movement by the ordained. It moved forward by the ordinary. So it was people not just in the worship space, but it was people in the workplace. These were the contacts. These were the areas in which the conversation went on. I have come to be convinced that the first century is a sister century to the 21st century. Even the scripture says that a thousand years is, is but one day with the Lord. So you have the little sister born in the first century, and then you have the second twin born in the 21st century. In the Mediterranean world, what, what God did around the Mediterranean Sea in the first century, I believe we have the potential to see done around the seven seas in the 21st century. It's as though the first century was a dress rehearsal for the 21st century. 
In the first century, politically, you had the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. In the 21st century, you have the Pax Americana. How long it will last? We don't know. People did not necessarily like Roman soldiers in the first century, but Rome ruled. And a person does not have to like American armies, but American technology and armaments rule. The politics was matched by an economic, like an economy, a, 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 a range in which you had trade that was largely unhindered. In the first century, it was one of the first times in human history that you had a whole zone in which pirates were, were wiped out. That's the equivalent of hijacking today. And... Uh, so you, you had, you, there was a high value to have unobstructed economic activity. The social organization was organized around cities in the Roman Empire. Do you realize that it took us to the 21st century to become an urban planet? Somewhere around the year 2000, maybe the year 2010, some say 2007, whatever, uh, as we moved into the 21st century, for the first time in planetary history, this planet became an urban planet. More than 51% of people live in urban areas. The movement of the Christian faith at its best has always been an urban movement. The Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, was a rural period of time. And what happened in the first century is it went viral. Why did that happen? How, did, how were they able to do that? I want to use an image. I'll give you the image. The image is a picture of both a sanctuary, uh, a body, and a temple. It comes from 222, John 2, 1 Peter 2, Ephesians 2. It's a mixed metaphor. The image of the body of Christ the image of the people of God being the temple of God, where did this image, this mixed metaphor of a body and a temple come from? It's not in Buddhism. It's not, you don't see it among Hindu thinkers and such. It's not Muslim. It's not anything else. It came from Jesus. Jesus in John chapter 2 said, tear down this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. And they said, oh, are you? greater than our forefathers they took years to build this temple and will you rebuild it in three days and then john gives an explanation they did not understand that he was referring to the temple of his body they did not understand that until after the resurrection so embedded in the psychic of the first generation of christians was a double metaphor. Peter, Peter comes and says, you have come to the rock. You've come to the sanctuary. You lift up holy hands in the sanctuary to give praise to God. You are priest unto God. And uh, he understood this uh, very clearly, that uh, we are, we are priests like, like uh, stones, living stones being built into the temple of God. You remember that the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 says that in fact we are members of the body of Christ. We are built on the chief cornerstone, which is Jesus, with the foundation of the prophets and, and, the, and uh, the apostles. And we are being built up into a holy temple into the Lord. So this very fascinating illustration of a temple and a body is primary in the first generation movement. I wonder if it will not become primary in the 21st century movement. The question is, how could Paul establish new followers so radiantly, rapidly, and responsibly. 
they were radiant because when a person came to Jesus, they, they just changed. Life came into them and they radiated the presence of the living God. It was rapid. I want to say that many of discipling patterns and such in the Northern European, the North European, the North American church are very slow. You need to be a Paul to a Timothy, and you need to disciple, and you need to learn, and it goes on. Uh, basically, the most North American and North European disciples and disciple programs have a very difficult saying the other R word, which is rapid, rapid. But the early movement was rapid. It moved quickly. How could they do that? But not only that, it was responsible. How do you have a standard for leadership, a standard for community life that is responsible so that you don't just have religious growth, but you have church growth? You don't just have uh, something that is not grounded in healthy teaching. The Apostle Paul said that he could do it because he had a pattern. He said, I have handed on to you the pattern, the typos of sound words, of healthy words. This is what you received, and this is what you are to pass on to others. You're not to alter it, you're not to adjust it, you're just to pass it on. It was a pattern that was received, retained, and reproduced. That pattern is given to us in 2 Timothy 1, 1 Corinthians 4, and Romans chapter 6. In, first, in 2 Timothy 1, verse 12, he makes the point that again, Timothy, I have passed on to you, I have given to you, I have entrusted to you. Uh, you are to keep this. The old English word, the keep, was the castle inside the castle. Uh, in Narnia, the tales of the Chronicles of Narnia, they moved... Once the outer wall was broken down, they moved inside the keep. And the keep usually had its own water supply. It had fortification. It sometimes lasts for several years there. So it, just, it was the ultimate thing. You're to keep this. You're not to alter it. You're to keep it. And it is the pattern, the typos, from which we get our English word, the typology. This is a typology of, of healthy words. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, the Apostle Paul notes the fact that he doesn't have to be there personally. He said, I'm sending to you my son in the good news, Timothy, and he will tell you of my ways, which I teach in every congregation, in every place. Now, let me ask you this. Do you have a pattern of teaching that you, as a leader, teach every place in every congregation? And I will tell you that for myself, in 25 years of ministry, I did not have that. Hear me carefully. I was a part of the North American pattern in which if you minister well, you are commended highly. So if I just did ministry myself and did it faithfully and did it consistently and did it persistently over a period of time, I could retire and everyone said, you've had a wonderful ministry. But I want to say this, if you shift from a paradigm of the ordained to the ordinary, the standard is not how you minister, the standard is how you multiply. And an apostolic or a missional paradigm is a paradigm of multiplication, not just ministry. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians, and 2 Thessalonians, he said, I have taught you everything that you need to know. Now let me ask you this. How long was he in Thessalonica? About three weekends, three Sabbaths. Now if he came in on a weekend, then he might not have been in Thessalonica for more than two weeks. One Sabbath, the week, another Sabbath, another week, and there. So only two weeks and three weekends. Maybe he was there three weeks. So he was there two or three weeks. By the end of that two or three weeks, he can write them a letter and say, as you yourselves know, as I taught you when I was in your midst. 
Do you have a way of sharing the good news in Jesus Christ with a person so that if you spent two, or my word, three weeks with them, you could later say, even if we never see each other again, I've passed on to you everything that you need. Now, if you mess up, I can say, no, 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 wait, wait, you didn't understand what I taught you. You didn't understand the pattern. Let's go over the pattern again. Remember, I said this. So you just go back over the pattern. So it's not that people won't get off, but you now have the pattern. And that's why Romans chapter 6 is very interesting. Because in Romans chapter 6, around verse 17, what he says is, is that you, I entrusted you to the pattern, to the typos. Now that's interesting. You see, if, if, you're, if this is the pattern, come pattern, this is the pattern, and bro, stand. See, one of the things is I commit the pattern to you. Ha. I commit the pattern to you. But notice this. In Romans 6, he says, I commit you to the pattern. You see, if I commit the pattern to you, you put your arm around the pattern. I've, here's the pattern. It's committed to you. Keep Keep your hand on it. But now then, in Romans, he says, I have committed you to the pattern. Put your armor in here. Ha. Huh. Because you are to teach the pattern to others, but you can also have a standard of, of, of for self-correction and revitalization because you are committed to the pattern. It's in the past even. You can look at the Greek and everything like that. Are you with me? Thank you. Both pattern and, and pastor. <laughs> okay. First of all, the pattern is the rock. There has been discussion, you remember, in, the, uh, in Roman theologians, uh, Roman Catholic theologians say that Peter was the rock. The church is founded on the rock Peter. However, the problem is, is that Petros uh, used some 111 or so times uh, is always a reference to Peter, etc. But Petra, when Jesus said, you're Petros. A Petros is a stone that you can pick up and throw. But a Petra is like those huge cliffs out in Arizona, you know, that's where the road runner runs out and then it falls off and everything. Like, it is like, again, Mount Blanc uh, in, in uh, Europe. It, 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 it is a huge cliff. And that's why he says in the last days, when people realize the Son of Man is returning, they will flee into the caves and the sides of mountains and they will cry for the Petra, for the mountains to fall on them. Jesus said, you are Petros upon this Petra. I will build my church. The word Petra is only used uh, less than 15 times in the New Testament, and every time it's used, it's used of an actual physical rock or it's used of the teachings of Jesus or of Jesus himself. So the foundation, remember, if Peter was the rock, he could have said, remember, I don't want to brag and everything, but since I'm writing 1 Peter, I'm just telling you here that you have come to me the living stone. He didn't say that. He said, you've come to the living stone, which is, is Jesus, and you've built your life upon him. So the rock is Jesus. In one way or another, people need to be introduced to the rock. The whole issue of life is introducing people in the midst of storms and tsunamis and floods and oceans. People need a rock. Then, if they find the rock, they are to turn and follow. From that, they can build their house. But remember, this is what is exciting. You see, the temple is also the body of Christ. So the temple has one, two, three pillars. You have three pillars, or the robe of Jesus has three pleats within it. Does that make sense? There are three things in this, faith, love, and hope. 
And in this, he tells people to walk worthy. In love, he tells them that you are to abide by the word and the spirit and that in hope you bear witness. Now, everyone, I want you to draw this. So if you're doing it electronically and you, you, have, you can draw electronically, if not, but if not, I want you to get a piece of paper. So everyone, draw this right now. In a moment, by the time we finish, you are going to explain this to someone else, all right? So here's the image. First of all, draw yourself a rock, okay? There's a rock. Then draw a foundation because you see it's not about theory. You must turn and follow him. You must build upon this foundation, okay? So this is the foundation. You must turn and follow. Then watch what I do. Here's how you draw it. Go up and out, but now watch this. You go up like this and then go up and come down. Uh-huh, like that. Are you with me? Draw that right now. Then if you just put the head like this, there you go, all right? And this is really good. Here's a thumb and a palm, okay? It looks like mittens, I know. Okay. So you have both the building of God and the body of Christ, okay? Then if you draw two lines, you get three columns or three pleats. Three pleats in the robe of Christ, three columns in the, in the uh, temple of God. The three categories are faith, love, and hope. The Apostle Paul said, here's how I pray from, for you. I pray for your work of faith, your, your labor of love, and your endurance of hope. This is what I pray for. What he talks about here is that you're to walk worthy of God. You're not to bring shame on Jesus. Then he does something very interesting. There are two places that you can see the, the pattern very clearly. Colossians and Ephesians. Now some people have said, why do you think it's most clear in Ephesians and Colossians? I'll give you my answer. Most of the New Testament literature, the epistles of the literature, is what's called by the technicians, by the theologians, by the scholars. It's called problem literature. When Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, they were having a problem about quitting their day, day job because they were thinking Jesus was going to come. He said, wait, don't quit your day, do, day, your day job. Uh, when he dealt with the Corinthians, the problem was uh, they had kind of like some chaos. They, they, they had people that were listening to the Holy Spirit and doing things, but they were using their gifts, and some that were using the gifts of speaking in tongues, they weren't getting an interpreter. He said, wait, 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 they, that's a real problem. Everything needs to be done in order and everything. Uh, they had jealousies. They had, they had already many denominations. I'm a Peter. I'm a Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm a, oh my. So everybody was breaking. He said, you know what? Did Paul, was he crucified for you? Did Peter save you? He said, it's all about Jesus. So he, he had, pro they had problems. Okay. So you can continue. Now, Colossians and Ephesians, he's not dealing with problems. Why? because he's in prison. These are the prison epistles. So now that he's in prison, he deals with the principles, not the problems. And that's why you can see it so clearly. You have with you a sheet of paper. I'll just explain what this is. If you take this here, you look and one of them here says the difference, okay? You turn it over on the other side and it says we have a different logic, different lifestyle. If you will take the right-hand side where it says a different logic, a different lifestyle, and just turn it over a third of the way, you can make yourself a threefold, okay? And then take the front and turn it like this. I will tell you what you have in your hand. You have the book of Colossians. It's the book of Colossians with one addition from 
the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. I will tell you what is happening for us uh, in the New Delhi area. There's a group of us, and we are memorizing the book of Colossians. It's two pages. Notice the division. A different Lord, open it up. A different logic, open it up. A different lifestyle. That's what's different. He wrote his letter to the saints at Colossae, the saints at Thessalonica, the saints in Rome, the saints in Corinth. The word used in the Greek language is hagias. Hagias. It means different. It was used of apples. If you were eating an apple and you cut a piece off from the main apple, this little chunk that you're about to eat is hagias. It's a different piece of apple. Hmm. So you could sing the, the song, you know, holy, holy, holy. I guess you could say, different, different, different. Because we serve a holy God, he is different from the gods that are conceived by human imagination. So what we're calling this is the difference. What is it that makes you different from others? Paul explains the difference to the different people, the saints at Colossae. Does that make sense? Rudolf Bultmann, known mainly for his uh, radical and liberal thinking, was a person that was very much perplexed and engaged dealing with the history of religions. He wrote an article in about 1923, I think it was, and in that it became a a stack pole article that is referred to to this very day. He said that in all the major world religions, what you have is you have activities and actions, and you do these actions, and then you hope, you aspire, that you will then receive a deliverance, a salvation of some sort. Does that make sense? So you have actions or works of merit, some kind of activities. It may be strenuous breathing activities or uh, physical activities. You may have dietary restrictions and such. But you will do something in which you have actions, and if you do them properly, uh, then you obtain salvation. He said, when the Christian faith came along, it changed the history of the world religions because it did something different. Watch me carefully. It took this and it turned it around. It said, first you have the experience of salvation and then you have an ethical life and you begin to do it. You begin to live out as a result of having this experience. So all the others said, do this experience, this experience, this experience, this experience, and you hope you will have uh, do this work, this work, this work, and you hope that you will then uh, have an experience of salvation. He said, the Christian said, you have an experience of salvation in Jesus, now then work out your behavior. So the others said, do the behaviors, and then you have the salvation. The other said, you have the salvation, so correct your behaviors. He called this the imperative and the indicative. He said, all the others are built on the imperative. Do this, do this, do this, the imperative. And then you will experience the indicative. You are a person that's been delivered. You are a person that's been saved. He said the Christians reversed that among the world religions. And they first said, first you are a new creature in Christ. You are a new person in Jesus. And because you are in Christ and you experience it, now then you have ethical behavior. So... It's first your belief and then your behavior. First there is the indicative of experiencing Christ and then there is the behavior. So what happens here, you see, is that there is Jesus and when you turn to him to follow him, you experience salvation. Because you've experienced salvation, now then you begin to live a different way. So you have a different Lord, you have a different foundation, 
a different logic for working it out, and then you have a different lifestyle. Does that make sense? I will only summarize here, but I will, I will look at here on the first page. We have a different Lord. What does that mean? Look at the middle of the page. Once you were alienated from God, enemies in your minds because of your e evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you if you continue in your faith, established and firm in love, not move from the hope held out uh, uh, in the good news. I gave you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery. The mystery has been kept hidden for ages, but is now disclosed to the saints. This mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery of God, Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. A person becomes different as a follower of Jesus because they have a different Lord. Okay, turn the page. We have a different logic. You see, all the other world religions and all the other spiritual pathways are based upon some sort of rules. And if you do all the rules properly, then you will have salvation. But we have a different logic. And I'll tell you again and again, you will find discipline and diet. Look for those two things. Discipline and diet. And sometimes uh, you have a distance from marriage. You will often have monks, so you will have people who do not marry, and then you have abstaining from certain kinds of foods. So in the different systems they can choose all kinds of different foods but there'll be different kinds of foods so notice this i tell you this we have a different logic i tell you this so that so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and empty uh, deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and on the basic principles of this world rather than on christ because in Christ, you see, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. He forgave us all our sin, and having disarmed the powers and prince authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, because you have this experience, because you exist in the indicative, this is who you are, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink. Do not let anyone judge you with regard to a religious festival. Do not let anyone judge you by a new moon or a Sabbath day celebration. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. You know, things like, oh, don't handle, oh, don't taste, oh, don't touch. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Isn't this an amazing way to think? This is contrary to the spiritual systems of the world. We have a different logic. You're not doing works of merit in order to be saved. You are saved, and therefore you work out your new ethical lifestyle as a result of it. So then, we have a different lifestyle. Therefore, ha, be imitators of God as dearly beloved children. Live a life of love just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. For you died, you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Wow, that's who you are. So out of the indicative, now here comes the imperative. And this is what we're calling the pattern. The Apostle Paul always treats them in this order. First faith, then love, then hope. 
He has trigger words so that you know when you're there. If he speaks about watch and pray, ding, boom, I know that I'm over here in the hope column. But if he says put off or put to death or put down or lay aside, I know I'm in the faith column. When he tells me what to do with masters or fathers or anything else, I know I'm in this column here in the love column. In fact, it's introduced by the words, word, and spirit. So I'm going to start just here. In fact, no, I'm not. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the whole thing, and then I'm going to tell you it again, then I'm going to tell you again and tell you again, and so, okay. In the simplest form, he says, the first thing you do is to look back by faith to Jesus. And with your faith in Jesus, you need to walk worthy of him. Don't bring shame on Jesus. If you turn to follow him, if you're going to build your life on him, walk worthy of him. That's what he says, walk worthy. That's a phrase inside this column, walk worthy of him. Don't bring shame on Jesus. How do you know when he switches? Ha, it's great. Finish this for me. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Yes. Teaching, singing, thanking, and submitting. Four present participles, uh, four participles in the present tense. Now then, if you go to Ephesians, he says, do not get drunk with wine, that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And then he says, teaching, singing, thanking, and submitting. Oh, the same exact um, activities in the exact same order because he's got a pattern in his mind. He's got a pattern. Now watch this. Let the word of God dwell in you richly, or you could say, be filled with the Spirit. Do you know that all through the history of the Christian church, Christians have tended to div divide themselves between the word Christians and the spirit Christians? Well, we have the word. Well, we have the spirit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he said, no, 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 no. The spirit inspired the word, and the word is the instructions of the spirit. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Because I'm not going to be around. I might be in jail. Or I might be dead. But let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. When I'm not there, you go back to the words of Christ. Because you are going to incorporate this into your life and you're going to imitate this. And just be filled with the Spirit. Ask the Spirit of God. Spirit of God, help me. And the Spirit of God will bring to your mind, if you are dwelling on the Word of God, the Spirit of God will bring the words to you so that you learn how to love others. Now, if you are following God and walking worthy of Him, and if you are loving other people and sensitive to them, you would think that the entire planet would come around and go, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. No, they won't. Because you upset the institutions and the systems of corruption. And with unjust systems, now then you're going to have to endure. And so then he begins to tell you that this is where your witness will happen. This is where your warfare will happen. This is witness or warfare that happens here. And basically he tells you to stand and resist, watch and pray, and he gives you the armor because he tells you there's two things. You become a person of intercession and you become a person of integrity. And when it's all over, you will at least do this. You will just stand firm, even if it's your last witness. You may die, but it will not be in vain. Okay? So here it is. Faith, love, and hope. Walk worthy of him, and by the word and the spirit, love others, and because you have a hope that cannot be defeated, intercede for others and be a person of integrity. Turn to a person right now, using your drawing, and explain this to them right now. I'll give you a minute 
So a minute and a half for each person. Go, right now. You explain it and your partner explain it. There's the buzzer, switch. Even if you're not finished, switch. Let the other person talk. All right, that gets you started. Now then, let's begin to fill it in. I want you to notice what happens. In the pattern, the Apostle Paul never starts with the positive. Many times, discipleship Methods start with positive things. You need to do this. You need to go to church. Uh, you need to uh, have a quiet time. You need to do this. You need that. The Apostle Paul never starts with the positive. He always starts with the negative. In other words, the first generation of Christians were acutely aware that when they came into this new experience of life, they came in with baggage. You know, two people can be, oh, just deeply in love. And they get married. And they're so happy. And then they begin to discover that they brought baggage into the marriage. You're acting like your mother. You're acting like hmm, you got baggage from the past. So the first thing he does is a negative, and then he goes to the positive. He first tells us to put off, and then he tells us to put on. The Apostle Paul uses a, a variety of, of uh, vocabulary. He may say, put to death this. He may say, lay it aside, put it down. In fact, he especially uses the thing like old garments, like, like sweaty garments or stinky garments. And he uses a combination. He actually tells you to take it off, set it down, push it aside, and walk away. Take it off, set it down, push it aside, walk away. So all of these things are involved with put off. Now, if he is talking to people raised with the Bible, for example, in the discipleship pattern, in the new pattern of life, the Apostle Paul and others would refer to Jews and Gentiles. Now think about this. A Jew is a person raised in a home with the Bible. Jewish children, Jewish parents had the Torah, they had the Bible, they learned the scriptures. So first, there's a category of people raised in a home with the Bible. 
Then you have people who are raised in a home without the Bible. Now, every one of us came from one of those kind of homes, right? Raised in a home with the Bible or raised in a home without the Bible. Fine. If he's speaking to people without, who are raised with the Bible, like he does in Romans, the first sin that needs to put off is hypocrisy. In other words, you're not doing what you know you should do. You're faking it. But most of the epistles and the enormous amount of people coming into this new movement were people from homes without the Bible. So what is the first thing that a person is to put off? He always starts with sex sin. He says, put aside sexual immorality. So the first thing that he invite, asks the new convert is, are you sleeping with someone you shouldn't be sleeping with? Now, there's a Bible study that will get relevant real quick. Well, you know, I don't think the Bible speaks to people. You know, you know I mean, this is the Bible. You know, you people are all, you know, stuck in the past and everything. Well, God just has one question. Jesus, you know, Jesus, gentle and mild. He'd just like to ask you one thing. Are you under the sheets with anyone you shouldn't be? Huh. You know what? That's amazingly cross-cultural. <laughs> this is cross-cultural. In California, we learned that we had to ask people, are you married? People say yes. No, and so are you saying that you actually were married and you're legally married? Well, sure. So you are definitely, you're actually married. You had a marriage ceremony. Well, we're like married. Whoa, because it's California, you know. But. No, no, no. It, you know, we lived in we lived in Thailand. In Thailand, a person has a wife, and then in the Thai language, you have a little wife. Well, she's not really your little wife. She's your mistress. And you can go around the world. Because you see, in a broken world, in a world going against the way that God would have us for flourishing, one of the first things is you think the wrong way and you act the wrong way. So idolatry and immorality is a part of the non-creator lifestyle. So he starts off with put off, put off sexual immorality. And then a person says, well, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not sleeping with anyone. So then he says, are you thinking about it or wishing it? So then he says, impurity, which means sexual impurity. I don't live in America, but of course, you wouldn't have to live in America to, to have the same kind of lifestyle. But some of the statistics are saying that there's almost no statistical difference between the porno shops that non-Christian men visit and that Christian men visit, that, that there's an enormous crossover into which if people aren't sleeping with the wrong person, they're fantasizing about the wrong person. Are you with me? But of course, this is just first century stuff, so it's probably of no significance, whatever. So. Are you with me? So look at the list. Look at the list. Notice that this is in order. I am not picking and choosing. You see, some of the discipleship ways in which people do it, they choose out a verse from Jeremiah, and then they go to Matthew. And then they say, and here's one from the book of Revelation, but here's one from 1 Peter, but don't forget the Leviticus, and also Isaiah. Well, what do we do? What I'm doing here is we're going through in the order in which Paul wrote it. All I've done is to organize it so that you can see where the trip vocabularies and where the, where the, the shape is, it is his writing, it is his order, this is the way he wrote to people in the first generation. Faith. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Someone will say, tell me what is the difference between all of these? 
we don't have enough time in an hour and a half. Do your homework. But I'm, tell, I'm showing you the pattern. You see? Okay. These, these make great, you can, you, can have, you can have a Bible study on this. We're going to just study what we're supposed to put off. And then you can go through the list. Okay, what is the list? Do you know of any people around you that having these problems? Do you have this problem? Th these become very powerful things just to walk through with your disciple. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. One of the difficulties of people joining into the Christian movement is the temptation to hide the struggles that they have. The early church did not do that. It just says, we know you're torn by like, like tornado winds, like, like, like uh, uh, cyclone winds. You, you are just, you're just ripped apart by different cravings and desires and, and stepping over the boundaries. We need to look at that, so put this off. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. Now you must rid yourself of all such things, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. He first starts with, with self-sins and then social sins. He goes from things that you do yourself to things you do with, uh, the, in social things, anger, malice, uh, anger, rage. You know, some people are anger people. Those are the kind that boil. And then there's the, you, you have boilers and volcanoes. And they usually marry each other. You know, one partner will just explode with anger. They'll just rage and... <laughs> and the other person just gets quiet. <laughs> they boil. <laughs> they might not talk for a day or <laughs> two days. Or <laughs> and then about the third day, <laughs> they just start talking again like it didn't even happen. But they've been angry for three days. So he said, I don't care if you are a volcano or you're just a pot boiling. Get rid of anger. Get rid of rage. Get rid of malice and slander. Filthy language from your lips. Do you know that every culture has bad language? Every culture. Ask people, what bad language, what do you tend to say when you get mad? What do you tend to call people? Why, these will make for lively Bible studies. And you have people who are newly, and they'll tell you, I say this, and I've said this, and I used to say, you're going to say, Remove filthy language from your lips. Do you remember that in the revivals in Ireland, and I mean in Wales, that they said that they had to kill off the mules in the underground mines because they always cussed at the mules. And when they stopped cussing, some of the men got saved and they didn't cuss the mules and the mules didn't know what to do. <laughs> they had to get rid and get, a, get new mules in, get some Jesus mules in so they knew how to pull the coal. Okay, so. Do not lie to one another since you have put off your old self with its practices. Put on the new self which in knowledge is being renewed in the image of its creator. Here, right here, at the image of the new creator, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. Christ is all and is in all. The basis of this discipleship is not culture. If you're an American, I will guarantee you, you will have to be a little less American in order to be a little more like Jesus. And if you are Peruvian, you'll have to be a little less Peruvian and a little more like Jesus. And if you are German, you'll have to be a little less German and a little more like Jesus. And if, you are, if you're Kenyan, you'll have to be a little more like those of Kenya. And do you see what I'm saying? Because here is the image of God. And we are all coming together from our different cultures and our different sins. You realize different cultures have culture sins, family sins, and individual sins. Americans, you can tell Americans in an international airport, they're the ones that are loud and demanding. Okay? There are cultural sins. And then you have family sins. You'll have people say, well, that's just the way we do it. That's why our family's already done it. Well, your family was wrong. You know? Uh, so, and then you have personal sins. There's some sins that you do that your sister doesn't do, your uncle doesn't do, it's just yours. 
So, so we have to look at even cultural sins, family sins, individual sins. But we are to put these aside because the image of creator, it's not about being a Greek or a, bar, or a, a barbarian, a, a Scythian. It, it is about being made into the new humanity by the standard of Jesus. Christ is all and he's in all. Put on, therefore, as God's both chosen, holy and beloved, the new clothes of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another grievances, whatever you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's the key. There is never the ability to say, I cannot forgive the person. It may be that you will not, but you can. And the root understanding is because Jesus forgave you. If you ever understood that Jesus forgave me, now I can forgive others. And above all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Does that make sense? Put off and put on. Work through these and work through the issues of putting it on and practicing it so that this becomes the new way in which you by faith look to Jesus and your whole purpose is just to walk worthy of him. Don't bring shame on the Lord Jesus. Does that make sense? Let's go to the second column. So he says here, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart since as members of one body you're called to peace and be thankful. I've included then where it says in Ephesians, be filled with the Spirit. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching, singing, thanking, and submitting. We call this here the TSTS. Teaching, singing, thanking, and submitting. This is the new mindset. People tend to grumble. The children of Israel grumbled in the wilderness. People are always complaining. In villages, in high-rise apartments, in urban areas, people complain. He said, here's how you are to teach one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now notice carefully, this is not necessarily a word to the ordained, this is a word to the ordinary. How many of you were in church, oh, let's say six months ago? Let me just see your hand. Were you, were, on a Sabbath day, were you in church? Okay. What was the sermon about? What was the outline? What was the outline? What was the sermon? Oh, oh, I'll make it easier. Two months ago. Were you in church two months ago? Let me see your hand. Come on. Oh, did none of you people go? Oh, okay. What was the sermon about? What was the outline? Huh. But if I say, amazing grace, you can continue and say, because what you hum, you become. What you hum, you become. And this is an argument for ethnomusicology. This is an argument that what the, the truths of God enter through your emotional gate, not just through your intellectual gate. Teaching one another, the didactic ministry of this movement goes forward not by sermons, but by songs. You hum what you become. Teaching one another with psalms. You got 150 of them. Give your new convert Psalm 1. Tell them to meditate on it and create a poem. And let someone else in the group put it to music. And they will have an, a, a relevant, culturally relevant beat and cadence and everything else because we teach one another with the psalms, with hymns. You need to know Amazing Grace. I think it is probably the, the hymn the, the, of, of the church universal. I once was lost, but I was found. I was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. I want you to know it's grace that brought me safe this far, and it's grace that will lead me home. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, with no less haste, we sing God's grace. Then when we first begun, what you hum, you become. And the scripture in the pattern tells you to teach one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. 
There are some songs that are being made that, you know, you don't even know them yet because the Holy Spirit's going to continue to teach. Uh, so it, it just goes on. Singing and gratitude in your hearts and thanking with your lips. Singing is in your heart, thanking is with your lips. My wife tells me I should only sing in my heart. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and thanking, uh, my oldest son was eight years old when he fell from an attic and broke his arm in two places. I could hear him at the hospital room when the doctor told me on the phone, we're taking your son in, and if we cannot get a pulse in 45 minutes, we will amputate his arm. I put down the phone to go to the hospital. Tosh Garcia was in the room with me, and later he asked me, about four weeks later, he said, Brother Tom, do you remember what you prayed when you put down the phone? I said, no, I don't. He said, I'll never forget it. I said, well, you're going to have to tell me because I don't remember. He said, the first thing you said was, I thank you, Lord. For this situation. And he said, I, I couldn't believe that you were saying that. You know what? I, I don't remember saying it. But we are to thank God for every situation. Because when we thank him, instead of becoming anxious or, or upset or angry, what we're saying is, God, I have no idea how anything good can come out of this. But I will stand in the midst of this most horrible situation, and I will thank you because you're Lord over my life. We thank him for all things in all circumstances. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Do you remember the, the, the prophet went along and he was on a, on, on a donkey and then an angel stood in the midst but the, don, the, 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 the prophet couldn't see it? And the, and the, the, the donkey, <coughs> it was a jackass, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. Kick the, don the jackass, you know, oh, oh. and finally the Lord opened his eyes and he, oh my goodness, there's a, you know, you know what the principle is? If a jackass tells you the truth, you need to listen. <laughs> That's a good biblical principle. Thank you, bro. I, you're going to write notes on that, aren't you? Uh, you know. If a person, a person tells you the truth, you can't say, well, I'm not going to listen to you. I don't like the tone of voice you use. Forget the tone of voice. <laughs> if a jackass tells you the truth, listen. You submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. I have followed him who is the way, the truth, and the life, and I will submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Now, I may come back and talk to you about your attitude, but if you tell me the truth, I'm going to submit to it. What is it that surprises God? It says that Jesus was amazed at the centurion because the centurion said, would you heal my boy? Jesus said, I'll go with you. He said, you don't need to, Jesus. I, too, am a man under authority. I tell that soldier, come, that soldier comes. I tell that soldier to go, and he goes. If you just say the word, Jesus, my boy will be okay. So Jesus said, well, then go, according to your faith. And he went, it took him two days, you remember that? He went, and two days later, he arrived. When they came out and said, your boy is here, he said, stop, tell me, when did it happen? And he ascertained, that's what the gospel says, he ascertained that it happened two days earlier when Jesus had said it and when he trusted him. And it then tells you in the gospel, Jesus said, I've not met this kind of faith in all the Bible-believing synagogues around. This was by a pagan because what it takes to surprise God is a person under authority. You will not learn to praise him in your spirit if you are an angry person that hides it behind religiosity. You submit to truth in your own heart and then you can walk with strength you can walk for years, and you'll not weary, nor will you, you tire. We must submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. And from that comes the strength. It's Calvary strength. This will turn the world upside down.
TSTS, teaching, singing, thinking, and submitting. And then he gives the five relationships, WH, CF, EE, IO, CA, wife, husband, child, fathers, employee, employer, that's slave and master. I believe it was primarily political and economic, and it wasn't racial. So this is employee and, and uh, employer, and then insider and outsider, the Christians and the outsiders, the non-Christian, and the Christian and the authorities. He gives one single thing for each person. Wives submit, husbands love, children obey, fathers instruct. Um, employees work hard, employers be fair. Insiders pray for one another, outsiders uh, let your witness be uh, towards outsiders with wisdom. Uh, Christian yield to the authorities and the authorities are to restrain wrong and to reward good. So that's the, that's the order, it's a list. It's the same order in Colossians. It's the exact same order in Ephesians. Have you ever noticed that Ephesians uh, there in chapter 4 and 5 is in the exact same order as it is in Colossians? The reason is he had a pattern. He had a pattern. You'll notice the pattern here. You see the first word? You can see it. Wives, husbands, children, fathers, employees, employers, insiders, outsiders. All of those are exactly in order. So I won't spend time except that those, that's the pattern. So when you listen to a person having a problem, you just find out, okay, what is the thing? You must read your own column. Listen, children are always reading their parents' column, and parents are reading their children's column. <laughs> wives read their husband's column, and, and husbands read their wives. No, no, read your own verse. Read your own verse. Okay. And uh, then that's where the thing, go ahead, question. Well, no, it, it is fathers, and I think that that's very interesting. He does definitely say it's the fathers who are to give the instruction. So that's, and many men don't do that. Many uh, sign that to their wife or something like that, and I think there's great value in that. I will mention this. I was in an underground church in uh, uh, in uh, China, and whenever I asked the people about this, the, the 30 leaders there said, no, it's not like that in the Chinese Bible. It's husbands and then wives. They said, we never in China, you, you, never, you never say the wife first, it's the husband first, and it's the fathers and then the children. And they said, it's I said, are you sure? And they said, no, it's in the Bible. And I, I, so I asked my translator from Singapore, and they looked, and then they, they looked at it and they said, oh, it, it is like this. And they said, we would never use this order. Do you realize that in the order, the person who is the minority person or the person under authority is always mentioned first? Wife, then husband, children, then fathers, employees, then the employers, the minority insiders, then the, the world, the outsiders, the Christian authorities. Why? Do you know that in all in Socrates and all the Greek philosophers, there is never a list like this? Never a list. To my knowledge, this is the only list in the ancient world in which minorities are mentioned before majorities. Why? I've got a guess. I don't know. Here's my guess. That in a broken world, many times the first person to feel the weight of the sin is the wife, not the abusive husband the traumatized child, not the arrogant father. The poorly paid employee understands and the rich employer just goes home and enjoys as well. Do you see what I mean? So many times it's this person that first responds in the grace of God. That's my thought. I, I, um. So then the last column is the wrestler. He switches whenever he has code words. The code words are stand and resist, watch and pray, and be steadfast. So two things here. You have a wrestler and a warrior. A wrestler and a warrior. So many of us are familiar with the warrior. The seven articles, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, the belt, uh, belt of truth. Two, the breastplate of righteousness. Three, the shoes of the gospel the sword of the spirit, etc. okay? So this is a warrior. 
But before that, he talks about a wrestler. A wrestler is a person of intercession. Uh, intercession. A warrior is a person of integrity. These are the two things that we want to happen. You see, S and R, stand and resist, W and P, watch and pray. Again, this is one of the places where the Christian movement has a unique vocabulary. You cannot find this vocabulary in any other spiritual movement. Where did the Christian church learn the phrases stand and resist, watch and pray? Could you not stand for just a little while and watch and pray with me? Who said that? Jesus, where was he? In Gethsemane, in the garden. And the church never forgot it. It's part of the pattern. Buddha didn't say this. Krishna didn't say it. Shiva doesn't have it. Confucius never conceived it. Stand and resist, watch and pray. And when you begin to intercede, you see, if you have an unreached neighbor or you have an unreached people group, you begin to intercede for it. Intercession activates history. Intercession activates history. So when you begin to intercede for things to be different, you have a hope that the world does not have. You have a standard that the world does not know about. And that's when you, be, you begin to pray for someone else. Jesus said, I don't just pray for you. I pray for all those who will believe on me through your word. I was prayed for in the, by Jesus. So, intercession. And then he says, whatever you do, stand firm. Take the belt of truth, just stop lying, and, 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 and we lie too much, we cheat and everything else. And take the flat jacket of righteousness, right? Take the helmet of salvation, I love that one, boy. Sometimes, you ever feel kicked and beaten down? Then you just grab the helmet, well, at least I'm saved. <laughs> the helmet of salvation. The shoes of the gospel ready to talk about Jesus everywhere, huh? The sword of the Spirit, and remember, that's not the Logos sword, that's the Rhema. You don't need the whole Bible. You ever feel stupid when you're talking to people? I, I do all the time. You ever go away from a conversation and you go, oh, I should have said that. Oh, man, I should. Oh, man. I always think of it later. That's why you ask the Lord, Lord, give me something to say. And he gives you a word. That's the Rhema, the word of the Spirit. <laughs> I just thought I'd say that, you know, that, why, and it, and it, it just strikes the person. The person said, wow, what did you think of that? And you go, I don't know, I, I, I've never said that before, you know, <laughs> because it's the word from the spirit. And the four alls, you pray all times and all ways for all people in all circumstances. And the seventh thing, the prayer. So when you've done all, you stand. People, you don't win every argument and you're not successful in every venture. But what you do is you stand. And even if it goes against you in this generation, you stand. Because you have a hope that the world knows nothing of. And from that position of integrity, in due time, you win. Okay? That's my understanding of the pattern. And that is you see about seeds, deeds, and pulling some weeds and pulling in some flowers. That's why when we intercede, it's not right for some people to be oppressed like they are, so we begin to pray for them. It's not right for them to not know fullness of life. We begin to pray for them. It's not right for people to live the way they were, so I just have to stand here and, 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 and bear witness here. So all of these seeds, deeds, and weeds, this is all part of it, and this is the whole thing. This is the pattern as I understand it. What I've done there, you've gone through the book of Colossians. It's in the order that he wrote it. And there are, like I say, trigger words for each of these 
uh, you can look at it in detail. I will say this, that I believe on record is uh, a PhD thesis that was completed in 2010. Uh, I wrote on the life code, which is about this code, okay? I hope to have this published both in something like this, more the academic form, but also a common form, and eventually to do it also in a comic book. Uh, we have it on the credit card, uh, which you can use and everything. If you draw this out on a, a pencil, I've run out of time, or I would have you right now just draw it uh, on a half sheet of paper, draw it on a napkin. I have drawn this on barf bags on airplanes. I've drawn it, I've scratched it in the dirt. Uh, uh, one of my students in San Francisco uh, went to, um, is Kenya, they speak Swahili? Yeah. So I saw him in the Washington, D.C. area, and he said, Dr. Tom, you told me in, your cl in the class in San Francisco that you have scratched the universal disciple, the pattern, in the dirt in India. I said, yes. He said, well, I've done it in Africa. I did it in, uh, under a tree in Kenya with 13 men. And he said, within a year and a half, they have started 27 new units of worshipers that are going. And he said, oh, we didn't have anywhere, we didn't have any equipment or anything. But he said, when I, I thought, I, don't, I can't do it. And I remembered, you scratched it on the ground. He said, I scratched it on the ground and they took it because they have the pattern. With this, the movement cannot be stopped. Wherever two or three gather for a meal or a conversation, you can point out, so I tell people, if you want to know what it's like to follow Jesus, this is what it's like. You'll need to put off the things of your past and put on these new things. Here will be the new relationships with people, and here's what happens. So this is, this is your personal life, your self-life. This, then, is your social life with people, and this is your society that needs to be systemically the, the larger thing. So I will say this that many times, again, you often interact with people over here with things that need to be corrected and come this way. But anyway, that's the thing. That's it. Uh, that's, that's the pattern. <laughs> we are right at the edge. Maybe we have a minute. Uh, do you have comments or questions? Yes. Yes. Huh. Uh, uh, am, am I am I missing something? Um, okay, so did you were you tracking with me? And my understanding is that I spent uh, a fairly large amount of time dealing with indigenous peoples and such, because in my estimation, in perhaps I, I guess I just really didn't communicate, which, which just really distresses me that that's the way you heard it. Um, my understanding is that the memory bank of the planet is in the indigenous peoples in their oral cultures. It's not written down. But the five stories of the father, the fellowship, the fall, the flood, and the fanning out are the creator, the community, the chasm, the catastrophe, and the clans. That's all in the indigenous peoples. And that, that then is, that's why the major, the, the first thing is the spirits. The first whole thing is that across the planet, I feel it hasn't been discussed. I feel that secular thinking has, uh, has almost ignored that. But I did not give attention to, for example, the individual like Latin America or so. 
because to me, the virus of 500 in the Middle Ages of Catholicism, whether it is Southern Europe or Latin America, it's all uh, Catholic. It is, it is that version of Christianity that is there. So it's actually very pervasive. But underneath that uh, are, is, is the animistic or the shaman. And I, I thought I said several times that the shaman is actually the most widespread religious experience on the planet today. I thought I said that several times. Well, I, I thought that it, I, now maybe I'm mistaken, but I was under the impression, correct me if I'm wrong here, is that in, it's moving far, hello. Let me pull this up just a second. Okay. Sure. Oh, well, what I was saying is that I feel like that any nation is written in the blood of its, uh, the ink of its own blood. And to me, the Civil War not only happened, but is, is continuing. Uh, I find that Anglo-Americans or, or white Americans constantly discount this as though, as though that's over, get over it. Now, I don't think that can be done. As a, as a person of faith and a person as an anthropologist, I think that that's a, a great mystery. So I would certainly agree that to me the, the Civil War and everything not only was what, because it was the bloodiest spot on this continent, it was the bloodiest spot of the nation. And it, it deeply affects the history of this nation and everything. Though, and to me, the more we give attention to these, the better we're gonna understand what's going on uh, in the global conversation and such. Let me see if this is, uh, what I was trying to do there is right here. The, the first, I, see, I don't know if you can see that from out. Can you see, do you see that it, it became yellow? Okay, so what I'm saying is that across the entire planet is an undergirding of animistic thinking. And so that includes uh, Africa, you just, you just go all the way. See, I, I believe it, it, it includes, a lot of people would say it's not in Europe. Well, to me, a person has not been on the ground in villages in Europe if they don't understand that animism is alive in many parts of Europe. And so Africa, Europe, just all the way across, that's, that's the background of all the others. The others may be more specific in teachings, but the spirits are everywhere. Uh, that's my understanding. Yeah, I, I don't know. So I, I, I would certainly want to correct that, and thank you for drawing it to my attention. But I, if, if I didn't say that or make it clear, I would want to. I feel like it's actually something that I hope this brings to the forefront, which many times is left out and ignored. And still we talk, until we start talking about shamans again, um, we're not going we're not going to go forward. Someone else? Actually, our time is probably up. Thank you very much. I'm here. I'd uh, be glad to speak with you. Um, when, if, if you come on Monday, I will simply mention this, that I've done a lecture in one year from August of 2009 to August of about 2010. And this is on how to bring about change as a template, a template that you can use uh, playing off of the Harvard University and Tufts University uh, thing on culture matters. 
in the, in the one year, what has surprised me, I put this out as almost a theory, like here's an idea, what do you think about it? And uh, my first time was with the finance and budget ministry of the Russian Federation in Moscow for their institute training their people for their treasury department. I've done it at Kabul University, at Qadi Azam University in uh, Islamabad, and in New Delhi and other places. Within one year, this has now generated five PhD uh, um, yeah, dissertations. Uh, University of Birmingham, University of London, Jamia Millia Islamic University in New Delhi, and Allahabad uh, Technical Institute, uh, and I believe one that's about to start with Andrews University. So this has been very interesting to me. Uh, as I speak, this is being discussed at Kashmir University uh, by the man who wants to do this at uh, Jamia Millia Islamic University. So if you have an interest in doing research in regard to social change and documenting it from the things, uh, we are gonna deal with this on Monday, Monday. morning, is it? Both um, times? Actually, this will be the ICER uh, lecture that, uh, or presentation that will take place in the School of Education. Um, the School of Education has one floor, uh, part of the building has two floors. What some of you don't know is that there is an underfloor. So go to the end of the School of Education, then take the stairs downstairs. Ah. And there is a, a, a little room um, where we will meet for this uh, special occasion um, and the presentation that you have just referred to. Um, let me uh, just also, uh, what time? Seven o'clock in the evening? In the evening, yes, this will be an evening event. Um, and uh, it will also be at the same time a webinar. Uh, we, will, we have invited uh, doctoral students from uh, several programs that are not on campus to join us uh, via uh, the internet. Um, Tom has brought just a few of the publications that have recently come out, and I'd like to share that with you. Uh, the first one is India Progress Prone, uh, 21st Century India, the Bali Raja Proposal of Mahatma Pule. For those of you who um, were here, you know that he has talked about Pule as the other Mahatma. There was Mahatma Gandhi, 100 years before there was Mahatma Pule. He is the one that uh, started to talk about Jesus uh, as the Bali Raj. And Tom draws conclusions how societies that espouse uh, the Jesus-shaped worldview have fared versus societies that have uh, been shaped by other worldviews and particularly India. So India progress prone may actually be a con contradiction uh, in term. It's very interesting uh, work. Um, I think $6 we said for this one. Then the other one is the Mahatma moment, tipping point Buddhism. Um, that's something that he had not had a chance to really talk about, but it, uh, other than mentioning it, Mahatma Buddhism is the Buddhism that was reshaped 500 years after Buddha actually was here on earth. It's a Buddha that now almost looks like the savior, Jesus Christ, after Thomas came to India. And what Tom actually did was, it's, it's actually quite interesting, he was part of an elect group that came together for the 2550th birthday of Buddha He's the only Christian that is actually part of a very thick commemorative volume that I have seen. I mean, you need a suitcase to, to, to actually. And article or chapter number six is this chapter that is beginning to make the rounds with evidence that actually is not public knowledge. Because if you follow the line of thought that is actually in the literature, and that is embedded in the historical sources of Buddhism, it would lead you to Jesus. And uh, he has included it with the full knowledge of the education minister, who is a personal friend of Tom. Um, 
four dollars for this one. We have another one, which I at the moment don't see. That's okay. Um, the, and then he also brought an example of this, uh, the Forward Press is a, the, the Time Magazine of India in two languages. And I already told you on Friday, or on Thursday, yesterday evening, is today Friday? Yes. Okay. I told you that behind this journal is actually uh, a, a philosophical idea. How do you reach those in India f that for thousands of years, literally, have been oppressed in the caste system um, and basically shielded off in a social prison, um, ha did not have the chance to, to have access to certain information and so on, and even to the English language, and that's behind this uh, journal. If you're interested, uh, what they do with it, um, a few examples for a dollar. And uh, we'll have it here in front informally. Yes? Okay, thank you for reminding me. Um, the Swan Lectureship as such is finished with what we have done until now. But we have a few um, events that we have planned for those of you who are more interested in entering a, I would say, a more informal um, discussion. Now, we have built it as a doctoral seminar because that's our main aim, to, to, to talk to people who are interested in research. But I want to say to you, if you are really dying to, to come and dialogue with Dr. Tom, it would be okay for people that are in the in All right, so it's basically open to those who want to. Um, okay, uh, near the mission department. Okay, it will be in that classroom. Nine o'clock um, till um, I think we said 11, but it's a little bit more open ended. And for those of you who are seminary students, uh, that's of course a day where you have a little bit more time. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I think this was um, an interesting time together of thinking along new lines. And uh, Tom, um, I just personally want to say what you brought to us uh, about uh, the universal disciple model is just brilliant, uh, how you have uh, pulled it all together. So let's pray together. And Dr. Tom, if I can invite you to to come and pray with us, and then we'll say goodbye, and happy Sabbath. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you, and I want to thank you, Lord, for giving me this opportunity to be with my brothers and sisters. I pray that in every way, Lord, we will each one test the things that we hear and only glue ourselves, only hold on to the things that are proper and right. So may we test everything by your word. And Lord, then may we cling to that and in so doing be transformed. I pray blessings for my brothers and sisters. I pray, Lord, in the deepest, deepest way that you help each person, Lord, to walk worthy of you. I ask you, Lord, that you help each of us to not just be around other people, to be sympathetic and to, to be with each other so that we may imitate you and fulfill your law. And Father, I ask you that you would make us agents to bring change, deep change, Father, so that the push down can be lifted up, the push backwards can be brought forward, and Lord, we can have a taste of what you want for us in the age to come. We can have some of that even now. So do your work. Thank you for this time. And I pray, Lord, that uh, then you use this. I, I give it 
to my brothers and sisters like our little brother gave Jesus to you, just little crumbs and little fishies and bread. And I pray that, Lord, they will use it for the blessing of others and the multitudes. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please join me to say thank you to uh, Dr. Tom for what he said. Thank <laughs> you.